Good morning and a happy Sabbath to each one of you. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. It is nice that uh, we can be in a warm church and, uh, and look outside and uh, see the snow and realize that uh, God's love is here, His people are here, and we have a chance to worship together. And so happy Sabbath to each one of you. And for those of you visiting, uh, we want to welcome you and trust that you will have a wonderful experience worshiping with us today. I want to welcome Brother uh, King to, from uh, Penticton. And uh, Brother King, you've been here uh, several times over the last year, several years. And so, uh, again, we just uh, want to say uh, happy Sabbath and appreciate you making the commitment and effort of coming down here. It's uh, very kind of you to do that. Thank you. Um, you know, this uh, past week or two, we've had some cold weather, and um, we're glad that it's warming up. Um, but before I start talking about cold weather and fun things, I want to um, bring before you a very exciting announcement here. And uh, you'll see in your bulletin here, this is a transfer membership uh, from Penicton to Asuyas, and this is for Greta. And Greta, we want to say uh, we appreciate you uh, coming from all the way from Penticton here. We are glad that we have some delegates from Penticton here also. Uh, but this is your second reading, so I'm going to ask for a motion that we accept Greta as a member here. We have that. All in favor and any opposed. And uh, again, we just want to say thank you and welcome to your new home church. So it is uh, wonderful to have you here. You know, one of the things that uh, uh, I have been uh, reading recently is about uh, what causes a church to grow, and I'm glad that we have uh, members coming in. And one of the other areas is that where the church is actually involved in the community. And uh, I just wanna thank a number of the volunteers that are here today for their involvement in the community. As many of you know, we've had a cold weather uh, warming center, I should say, uh, in the Oliver Church. Um, this is the second time we've had it open here this uh, winter season. Uh, we ran it for, I think it was about 10 days this last time, and we have uh, several volunteers that are here today that participated in that, <clears throat> and uh, I'm really appreciative of that, uh, and I thank you for the help. Uh, Rita came and did some uh, testing one night uh, for how the how the food v flavor was and, and the value, and I I appreciate that, Rita. <laughs> uh, for what it's worth, uh, we uh, had uh, the church in Oliver. I'm sure many of you are aware of that open around 4:30 <clears throat> in the afternoon. Uh, we had uh, in the sanctuary, we had taken out every second uh, pew area and put down mats, and uh, so those people that uh, did not have a home or were uh, cold, they could come in. Um, there was a group of volunteers from the Oliver Mission that was primarily responsible for the food, <clears throat> and there was hot meals available, there was clothing, there was uh, hand warmers, um, and uh, it was really quite well received. We had um, probably on the average about uh, three to four people a night. Some nights we were up to eight. Um, the other component of it was is that during uh, that cold snap, we had uh, several people, uh, elderly people that couldn't get uh, down into town because of their scooters, couldn't handle the snow. Uh, they came in, uh, meals were given to them. They spent a couple of hours there warming up. Uh, there was several um, single moms that uh, came in again just to get warmed up and, and uh, had food. Uh, there was a couple of times where people called because their plumbing broke down and we were able to get uh, somebody there to help on, on their uh, plumbing and get it going. Um, so oftentimes we had eight or nine people that came in and just uh, had uh, a evening meal and warmed up for several hours. So the Oliver Church had a really a very nice uh, article written up for them in the Oliver 
know, all of our chronicle the Suya's times combined. And so that's actually not only on, on the digital copy, but it actually got printed here. We were the front page on, on that uh, cover story, the first, first story of the new year. So uh, it was very positive. Our church has got uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, good press f uh, for the work that was done, and rightly so. Uh, but I just want to take a minute and thank uh, the volunteers from this church for uh, their support and work on it. So your church is involved in, in the community. Uh, I also am really pleased to see in our uh, bulletin here about quilt making. <clears throat> and so again, that's another area that uh, our church has been involved with, and the ladies of the church in particular have been doing a lot of good work on that. So if you are interested and would like to join that, um, you get a hold of Halair and she will help you that uh, with that. I assure you, she has lots of fabric to sew up. So <laughs> I, I have personally seen a lot of it. So there's much work to be done there to sew that fabric up. But uh, I want to thank uh, the ladies of the church for doing that. It has gone into course a number of the communities here in BC that have been affected by it here, and also to the cold weather shelter in uh, Oliver. So uh, good work on, on, on that. Timor-Leste became an independent country in 2002. The average age is 17, with a population of 1.3 million. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in Timor-Leste recognized that about 40% of the people are illiterate and decided that education was a way they could help their community. Here in Timor-Leste, our major center of influence is the Timor Adventist International School. The International School provides for the children an opportunity for a future and for a future development of their country. So Timor Adventist International School will provide the discipline, the education, Christian values and Bible based education. This educational facility is serving hundreds of students and families who are eager to receive a quality education. When this school was first established in 2015, it primarily attracted Adventist students who were facing strict requirements from the public schools to be in class on Saturdays. Now, Timor Adventist International School, or TAIS, is known throughout the country to offer something different. The teachers, with the lessons that they are preparing, that they will not only concentrate on what the book, uh, what the book say, the lessons like that, but we need to make sure that in every lesson we can integrate the, the lesson of faith. In, in the activities that they do. And that's what most of the parents really appreciate and that's the difference that they see in this school. It's really the purpose why we, we exist, why we are here in Timor-Leste, that we want uh, the people here to know more about uh, Jesus, more about God through our uh, education. Due to limited space a few years ago, the school could only fit a maximum of 20 students. Thanks to your 13 Sabbath offerings in 2015, they constructed additional classroom buildings, opening the door for more students to come to the school, enough for 160 students. I'm choosing this school because I'm feeling like this school is uh, the first time entering this area. I feel like so refreshing, especially looking at the environment and the people here, especially looking at those plants and looking at those birds. I feel like, wow, this school is really like a beautiful place for kids to enroll, to study here, to get a good education. Why I chose this school? Because this school starting with a uh, BBK foundation because for me as parents by BBK foundation that they will growing well to be to be have a good character to be like God. The school has helped the Adventist Church gain credibility in Timor Leste that could open the door to new methods of ministry here. Through the school or the CUI in here 
the government more recognize our existence of this, uh, uh, this Adventist in, in this country. That ne never happened before, but through this COI and the many government, even this, and the education, in the health and other things, because they know us, we have a presence here because through this uh, school. This quarter, you have the opportunity to support this school once again. They need a dormitory to house students who come from far away. This will give them a safe place to stay and make it easy to get to their classes. It will make Adventist education accessible to more kids in Timor-Leste. Please give to this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering and pray for the teachers and students here. Thank you for your support. I am so thankful and grateful to God for a lovely church family. I was stuck yesterday and this morning, Rachel and Brady came and rescued me and here I am. So I'm really, really grateful. Um, this morning we're going to start off our song service with hymn 100 and allow me read from Lamentations chapter 3 verses 22 and 23 and it reads the unfailing love of the Lord never ends by his mercies we've been kept from complete destruction great is his faithfulness his mercies begin afresh each day and we blessed Let's sing together hymn 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness. singing that song. Our next song is also found in our hymnals today, and it is song number two. 
all creatures of our God and King. to hear you all soon today. Our next song is in the chorus book and it's another song that I love to sing and it is called We Are His. so beautiful and I feel like they end too soon sometimes True. but they're so nice to sing and I just love that one that one especially reminds us of these cold days how um, 
you know, we put in a little extra effort and we open the doors that we can to help those in need. Um, so this reminds us of our mission. Now I invite you to stand with us as we sing our opening song, number 604 in your hymnals, We Know Not the Hour. Please stand. That you brought your Bibles along with you this morning. If you have, I invite you to turn to the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. And my wife Julie will be sharing that with us this morning. I'm going to be reading from the Message Bible this morning. A revealing of Jesus, the Messiah. God gave it to make plain to his servants what is about to happen. He published and delivered it by angel to his servant John. And John told everything he saw. God's word, the witness of Jesus Christ. How blessed the reader, how blessed the hearers and keepers of these oracle words. All the words written in this book. Time is just about up. I, John, am writing this to the seven churches in Asia province. All the best to you from the God who is, the God who was, and the God about to arrive, and from the seven spirits assembled before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, loyal witness, firstborn from the dead, ruler of all earthly kings. Glory and strength to Christ, who loves us, whose blood washed our sins from our lives, who made us a kingdom, priest for his father forever. And yes, he's on his way. Riding the clouds, he'll be seen by every eye, every eye. Those who mocked and killed him will see him. People from all nations and all times will tear their clothes and lament. Oh yes, the master declares, 
I'm A to Z. I'm the God who is, the God who was, and the God about to arrive. I'm the Sovereign Strong. Thank you, Julie, for sharing that scripture with us this morning. Brother Keith, uh, the time is yours, and uh, we look forward to your thoughts this morning. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, let, let's pray before we start. Oh, Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for this privilege that you've given me to share your word. And Lord, just I pray that nothing in me will prevent your word from going forth with power. That you will just work in me. Take over, Lord, and just make your word have real authority in all of our lives, including my own. And oh, Lord, help us to learn from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, John was the last of the original apostles, and he lived to a very ripe old age. Church tradition says the Romans tried to boil him alive in oil, but the Lord's supernatural protection brought him out of the boiling oil without a mark on him. Now, if this story is true, the Romans must have been utterly amazed and fearful. They must have thought, this is no ordinary man. He has divine help. Uh, we'd better not harm him. But there's more than one way to harm a man. They exiled John to the island of Patmos, a windswept prison island. It seemed like the perfect way to rid themselves of this troublesome prophet. When we are alone with our thoughts, we may be tempted to think that God has abandoned us, or at least is not listening to our prayers. But here in this lonely island, cut off from the believers in the rest of Asia, John was visited by the resurrected Lord. The Lord is even in our solitudes. The first words of our text are the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, if you listen to the news or even to your next door neighbor, often you hear the word, the word of apocalyptic events. Uh, more and more we're hearing of great catastrophic events assuming apocalyptic proportions or resembling a biblical apocalypse. Now this is a change in meaning. The original Greek word apocalypse did not mean the destruction of the world or some momentous catastrophic disaster. The word is the very first word of our text, revelation, that we read in the beginning of our text. It literally means an unveiling, a revealing, a showing forth of some tremendous truth. And it is the revealing of not just any truth, it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. A special revealing of the truth about Jesus, a truth that not only reveals him, but also is his truth that he shows forth. Revelation is not a closed and forbidding book. It is meant to reveal the Lord to us. God wants us to understand and believe in him. The gospel is a proclamation of power and authority, the power and authority of Jesus Christ. He is the Lord of life and death. We are not talking about some little human philosophy that changes with every whim of public opinion. We are talking about the eternal God who has inserted himself into human history. Revelation 1, 1 and 2, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Now this special revelation that has been given by God the Father to Jesus Christ is to reveal what must shortly come to pass. But anyone who reads the Bible will soon realize that God's time is not our time. <laughs> Peter wisely observes in 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9, and we're reading from the J.B. Phillips translation, you should never lose sight of this fact, dear friends, that time is not the same with the Lord as it is with us. To him, one day may be a thousand years, 
and a thousand years only a day. Keeping, uh, it is not uh, that he is dilatory about keeping his own promises, as some men seem to think. The fact is that he is very patient towards you. He has no wish that any man should be destroyed. He wishes that all men should come to repent. Now there are those who scoff at the message of Christ's second coming. Peter speaks to this issue in 2 Peter 3, 3 to 9 in the Phillips translation as well. First of all, you must realize that in the last days, mockers will undoubtedly come. Men whose only guide in life is what they want for themselves. And they will say, what has happened to his promised coming? Since the first Christians fell asleep, everything remains exactly as it was since the beginning of creation. They are deliberately shutting their eyes to a fact they know very well. And that there were, by God's command, heavens in the old days, and an earth formed out of the water and surrounded by water. And it was by water that the world of those days was deluged and destroyed. But the present heavens and earth are also, by God's command, being kept and maintained for the fire of the day of judgment and the destruction of wicked men. So the scoffers are, in fact, fulfilling prophecy by their very scoffing. This, too, was prophesied to happen before the Lord's return. We run into this scoffing attitude in many places in the world today. The story is told of a little old lady who was talking to her next door neighbor who was not a believer. She told him the story of Jonah and the whale. Now, the neighbor said it was physically impossible for the whale to swallow a human being because even though it was a very large mammal, its throat was very small. The little old lady remained steadfast in her position and reiterated that indeed a whale had swallowed Jonah. Now, irritated, the neighbor again stated that a whale could not swallow a man. It was physically impossible. The little old lady said, I'm not sure how it happened, but when I get to heaven, I will ask Jonah. The unbelieving neighbor replied smugly, well, what if Jonah isn't in heaven? The little old lady replied, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> Returning to our text, there is a special blessing conferred on everyone who reads and everyone who hears and obeys the revelation that Jesus is sharing with John. Revelation 1.3, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it for the time is near. Blessed is he who reads. Yet we often meet people who have not been blessed I had an uncle who told me that he had read the Bible from cover to cover three times, and it meant absolutely nothing to him. Now, how could such a thing be true? It often depends on how open the reader is to believe what he's reading. Some minds are like concrete, thoroughly mixed up and permanently set. In Mark 6, 1 to 6, in Philip's New Testament, we read the following story. Then he left that district and came into his own native town, followed by his disciples. When the Sabbath day came, he began to teach in the synagogue. The congregation was astonished and remarked, where does he get all this? What is this wisdom that he's been given? And what about these marvelous things that he can do? He's only the carpenter, Mary's son and bro the, his brothers of James and Josie's and Judas and Simon, and his sisters are living here with us. And they were deeply offended with him. But Jesus said to them, no prophet goes unhonored except in his native town or with his own relations or in his own home. And he could do nothing miraculous there apart from laying his hands on a few sick people and healing them. Their lack of faith astonished him. So the people in Jesus' hometown, Nazareth, rejected him because they didn't want to believe that he had any authority. We can see this same attitude of disbelief in many areas of our humanistic world today. 
The point is that if we want a blessing from reading Revelation, we must be willing to believe that there is a blessing from reading Revelation. <laughs> As the book of Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 6 reads, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith is a personal requirement if we expect to be able to please God. Jesus points this out in John 7, 16 to 18, once again reading from the Phillips New Testament. My teaching is not really mine, but comes from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do God's will, he will know whether my teaching is from God whether I merely speak on my own authority. A man who speaks on his own authority has an eye for his own reputation. But the man who is considering the glory of God who sent him is a true man. There can be no dishonesty about him. We must be willing to believe, not in some wildly superstitious way that doesn't rely on evidence, but according to a recognition that we do not know everything, and God is much smarter than we are. <laughs> Dr. Donald Chittick, PhD in physical chemistry, points out in his lecture on the puzzle of ancient man that we all have a test for truth. Either we depend upon human opinion or we depend upon the word of God. Remember, the Bible has stood the test of time for thousands of years. It is we who are the newcomers on the scene, and we must be willing to bow to higher authorities than our own ideas. Jesus told the Pharisees in John 5, 36 to 44 in the New Living Translation, my teachings and my miracles, the Father gave me these works to accomplish, and they prove that he sent me. And the Father who sent me has testified about me himself. You have never heard his voice or seen him face to face, and you do not have his message in your hearts because you do not believe in me, the one he sent to you. You search the scriptures because you think they bring you eternal life, but the scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. Your approval means nothing to me because I know you don't have God's love within you. For I have come to you in my Father's name, and you have rejected me. Yet if others come in their own name, you gladly welcome them. No wonder you can't believe, for you gladly honor each other, but you don't care about the honor that comes from the one who alone is God. So keeping in mind the necessity to believe Jesus, we return to our text, Revelation 1.3. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. We keep reading that the time is near, and yet we know that thousands of years have passed since this revelation was given. Should we be skeptical and unbelieving? No. Now is the time to reconfirm our confidence in God's word. In the Amazing Facts book of Bible Answers, Doug Batchelor tells this story to illustrate what our attitude should be. A young monk in a monastery was reading some scriptures that told about Christ's coming. He got very excited and ran out to St. Francis, who was hoeing peas in the garden. The young monk exclaimed, Jesus is coming! Yes, my son, St. Francis replied. He's coming soon, emphasized the young man. St. Francis acknowledged, I know, my son. Well, asked the monk, how can you just sit there and hold your peas? Uh, what, if it, what if it was going to be coming tomorrow? What would you be doing now? Well, first I'd finish hoeing the peas, St. <laughs> Francis answered. That's the attitude I think Christians should have. Be faithful in what lies closest to you, because we don't know the day or the hour of Jesus' return. Let's return to our text. Revelation 1 4. 
John to the seven churches which are in Asia. The seven churches are not mentioned by name in verse 4. But if we jump to verse 11, Jesus tells us, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Now, each of these churches were connected on one postal route through what is mostly Turkey today. Jesus had a special message to each church, comforting some and calling others to repent and change their ways. Ellen White points out on page 585 of the Acts of the Apostles, and I quote, the names of the seven churches are symbolic of the church in different periods of the Christian era. The number seven indicates completeness and is symbolic of the fact that the messages extend to the end of time, while the symbols used reveal the condition of the church at different periods in the history of the world. Close quote. If we translate the names of the seven churches into modern language, we find the following meanings emerge. Ephesus means desirable, the first church from Christ to A.D. 100. This church needed to repent for the loss of their first love. In Acts chapter 19, we read of the riot that resulted in Paul being brought to the Grand Theater in Ephesus for crimes against Diana of the Ephesians. Smyrna means myrrh or perfume. And this is the period from A.D. 100 to A.D. 323, the period of persecution just before Constantine's so-called conversion. Pergamos means citadel or fortress or city on a hill. This is from A.D. 323 to A.D. 538, leading up to the 1260 years of the Dark Ages persecution. Thyatira means contrition, that is remorseful and penitent, or sweet savor of labor, or sweet savor of sacrifice. This is talking about A.D. 538 to 1798, the period of the Dark Ages. Sardis means that which remains, or remnant. A.D. 1798 to 1833, those who remained after the papal persecution in the Reformation. Now, Philadelphia means brotherly love. This is the period from 1833 to 1844, and the Adventist movement does some link this to the dawn of the missionary movement also. And Laodicea means judging of the people. It represents the era of the lukewarm church of our modern times. There is one more church which did not have a letter, but is spoken of in Revelation 12, 17. The commandment-keeping church that leads to the end of days when the Lord returns. Now, taking the meanings of the names of the churches into consideration, the following paragraph illustrates the attitude of heaven. When you first loved Jesus, you were beautiful and desirable, Ephesus. But watch that you do not forget your love for Jesus. When others begin to persecute your love and belief, you are like a perfume of righteousness to the Lord, Smyrna, as you stand firm in your witness. You are like a city set on a hill, per Pergamos. Your light cannot be hidden. If you remain pure and are not seduced by the world, if you stay true even under persecution, you are like a sweet savor of sacrifice to the Lord, Thyatira. But hold fast to what you've learned and don't listen to the enemy. If you will repent and stand fast, you will be a beloved remnant to the Lord, Sardis. You have an open door of witness before you, and you must show that you are Christians by your love for each other, Philadelphia. The time of judgment has arrived, Laodicea, and you must make sure that you are seeking all your resources through the grace that is ours because of what Jesus has done for us. In the end, your loving obedience to God's word will be the most important element of your character. 
That's the last church of Revelation 12, 17. If you open the door to Jesus and allow him to come into your life, you will know the joy of your Lord. Someday you will see him face to face. Now, since we are living now in the time of the Laodicean church, let's take a moment to examine that church. The Laodicean church was a self-satisfied, apathetic church. It believed that it was rich and in need of nothing, and yet it didn't realize how poor it really was. When we become too comfortable, we lose our real focus. We forget what we are here for. The story is told of a little lad who had a large vocabulary, and he was once asked what his church believed. And he thought about it for a moment and then replied, well, I've been told that we believe in salvation and damnation and justification and glorification and predestination and sanctification and since it looks like everything we believe in ends in Asian, I guess we also believe in mortification, vexation, taxation, vacation, and mum says we especially believe in procrastination. <laughs> now what is the Lord's message to the Laodicean church in this age that we live in? Jesus tells us in Revelation 3, 15-16, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, since you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's the New King James Version. Then in verses 17 and 18, he tells the Laodicean church that they are not rich and self-sufficient, but are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Revelation 3.17 the Lord tells all of us to buy from him gold refined in the fire, to be really rich and white garments in order to be clothed and not be ashamed before God. He also tells us to anoint our eyes with eye salve so we can see, that is, see from God's perspective according to his word. Everything the Lord does, he does from motives of love. The Amplified Bible brings out this tenderness in Revelation 3, 19-22. Those whom I dearly and tenderly love, I tell their faults and convict and convince and reprove and chasten, I discipline and instruct them. So be enthusiastic and in earnest and burning with zeal and repent changing your mind and attitude. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears and listens to and heeds my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will eat with him and he will eat with me. He who overcomes and is victorious, he will, I will grant him to sit beside me on my throne as I myself overcame, was victorious, and sat down beside my father on his throne. He who is able to hear, let him listen to and heed what the Holy Spirit says to the assemblies, the churches. Close quote. Now these words to the Laodicean church in the last age remind us of Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Members of a Laodicean church need to remember that character is built on what you stand for, but reputation comes from what you fall for. Having taken a short detour to view the seven churches, let's return to our original text and, and seek to see what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. Revelation 1.4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace. When John says grace to you and peace, he was using a particularly Christian greeting. The grace and peace in a Christian's life is from the Lord Jesus Christ. John exclaims in John 1, 16 and 17, And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus told us in John 14, 27, 
Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. This grace and peace does not come from the Son only, but it is part of the great gift that the Father has given to us. In Revelation 1.4, John tells us grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. Now this person, if you note the context, is in fact God the Father. It is a New Testament Greek way of saying what the Almighty told Moses in Exodus 3.14. Bringing out the different tenses being used for God's name, the Amplified Bible translates Exodus 3.14 this way. And God said to Moses, I am who I am and what I am and I will be what I will be. And he said, you shall say this to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God is telling Moses that he is in complete control of his own existence, past, present, and future. Little wonder that John describes God the Father as him who is and who was and who is to come. Revelation 1.4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before the throne. Now who are these seven spirits who are before his throne? Isn't there just one Holy Spirit? Yes, there is one Holy Spirit, but the use of the number seven here is to communicate that God's spirit is absolutely perfect and complete, lacking nothing. In Isaiah 11, 1 to 2, the prophet tells us, And the, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, referring prophetically to Jesus Christ. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now this is the classic example of the way the Bible shows the attributes of the Holy Spirit. You'll notice that there are seven. Number one, he's the spirit of the Lord. Number two, the spirit of wisdom. Number three, the spirit of understanding. Number four, the spirit of counsel. Number five, the spirit of might. Number six, the spirit of knowledge. And last but not least, the spirit of the fear of the Lord. All of these are attributes of the one Holy Spirit. John continues by telling us in Revelation 1.5, Grace to you and peace from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Now no one can object to the fact that Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. As Jesus said before Pontius Pilate in John 18.37, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Jesus can't help but bear witness to the truth, since he is truth personified. As he told us in John 14, 6 and 7, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Revelation 1.5 And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Now you might ask, well, how can Jesus be the firstborn from the dead? He wasn't the firstborn, the first person who rose again. There are many examples in both Old and New Testaments of others who rose before the time of Jesus. Now it's obvious the word firstborn here is not talking about being first in a numbered order. As a matter of fact, the Greek word used for firstborn comes from a word that means foremost in time, place, order, or importance, depending on the context. In the context of this passage, the meaning is that Jesus is the most important of all those who have or ever will rise from the dead. 
is only because Jesus has risen that anyone, past, present, or future, has any hope of rising again. Christ is the most important and preeminent of all who have or ever will rise from the dead. He makes all those other resurrections possible. Have you ever noticed that Jesus tells us that he has the power to lay down his life and take his life again? Who else has that kind of ability? In John 10, 17 to 18, he says, My father loves me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself, and I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. No wonder Revelation describes Jesus as the one who has the keys to death and the grave. Revelation 1.5, and from Jesus Christ, a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth. The Lord Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. In Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, we find a prophecy that's read every Christmas, but has a meaning that goes far beyond the child in the manger. It reads, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Revelation 1.5 to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Jesus will rule the nations. He is a king that is motivated by love and, will, and was willing to wash us from our sins in his own blood by dying for us on the cross. This is the very heart of the gospel message. What a wonderful, awe-inspiring message. We can be eternally grateful the God of the universe is a God of love. Paul beautifully describes this in Romans 5, 6 to 11. We read from the J.B. Phillips translation. And we can see that it was well we were powerless to help ourselves that Christ died for sinful man. In human experience, it is a rare thing for one man to give his life for another, even if the latter be a good man, though there have been a few who have had the courage to do it. And yet the proof of God's amazing love is this, that it was well we were sinners that Christ died for us. Now that we are men justified by the shedding of his blood, what reason have we to fear the wrath of God? If well we were his enemies, Christ reconciled us to God by dying for us. Surely now that we are reconciled, we may be perfectly certain of our salvation through his living in us. Nor am I sure is this a matter of bare salvation. We may hold our heads high in the light of God's love because of the reconciliation which Christ has made. The best mathematical equation I've ever seen is one cross plus three nails equals forgiven. And now we come to Revelation 1.6. Speaking of this great Savior that we have and what he has done for us, John continues with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to say that Jesus was made, has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now this speaks of the great heritage that we have as, God, as people of God. When the children of Israel were rescued out of Egypt by God's mighty hand, the Lord said to Moses in Exodus 19, 4 to 6, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, 
and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And these same statements are made by Peter to the Christians living in the five provinces of Asia Minor in 1 Peter 2.9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. You may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Do we really share in the great blessing the children of Israel have? Does the covenant of God also apply to the Gentiles? Yes. In the, living new, the new Living Translation, Paul says in Galatians 3, 26 to 29, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Now, Christians are a peculiar people. <laughs> A slogan in a black church in Kansas describes how different Christians should be. And I quote, wake up, sing up, preach up, pray up, and pay up, but never give up or let up or back up or shut up until the cause of Christ in this church and in the world is built up. <laughs> so if you are trusting in Jesus Christ and following him, then you are a child of God and John sees the glorious future approaching. In Revelation 1, 7, Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. When some read this verse, they wonder why people will mourn or wail when Jesus comes again. It will not be a wonderful thing to those who are not prepared for it. Ellen White saw this great event and described it in Desire of Ages, page 739, and I quote, When Christ shall come to the earth again, not as a prisoner surrounded by a rabble will men see him. They will see him then as heaven's king. Christ will come in his own glory, in the glory of his Father, and the glory of the holy angels. 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands of angels, the beautiful and triumphant sons of God, possessing surpassing loveliness and glory, will escort him on his way. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations. Then every eye shall see him, and they also that pierced him. In the place of a crown of thorns, he will bear a crown of glory, a crown within a crown. In place of that old purple kingly robe, he will be clothed in raiment of whitest white, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And on his vesture and on his thigh, a name will be written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Those who mocked and smote him will be there. The priests and rulers will behold again the scene in the judgment hall. Every circumstance will appear before them, even as letters in, written in fire. Then the whole world will know and understand. They will realize who and what they, poor, feeble, finite beings, have been warring against. In awful agony and horror, they will cry to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Close quote. C.H. Spurgeon saw just how changed a person must be if that person has seen the Lord is coming. And I quote, if your life is unholy, your heart is unchanged. And if your heart is unchanged, you are an unsaved person. If the Savior has not sanctified you, renewed you, given you a hatred of sin and a love of holiness, 
He has done nothing in you of a saving character. The grace which does not make a man better is a worthless counterfeit. Christ saves his people not in their sins, but from their sins. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Let every one that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If not saved from sin, how shall we hope to be counted among his people? Lord, save me now from all evil and enable me to honor my Savior. Close quote. Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Behold, he comes. He said he would and he will soon be here. Behold, he comes. He it is the Lord Jesus, your Alpha and Omega. Behold, he comes. Is he the beginning and end or goal for you? Paul encourages us with the words in Philippians 1.6, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Behold, he comes. Can you say along with Peter in 1 Peter 5.7 that you are casting all your care upon him for he cares for you? Ellen White wrote in the book that I may know him, and I quote, Devotion, piety, and sanctification of the entire man comes through Jesus Christ, our righteousness. The love of God needs to be constantly cultivated. Oh, how my heart cries out to the living God for the mind of Jesus Christ. I want to lose sight of self. Amen. Does that cry from Ellen White find an answering cry in your own heart? Can you join her in saying, Oh, how my heart cries out to the living God for the mind of Jesus Christ. I want to lose sight of self. Behold, he comes. We need to express our joy in the Lord. Join me for our last hymn, number 598. Watch ye saints.
Lord, help us to believe your holy word and look up. We know your coming is even closer now than when we began this service. Every passing moment, hour, day, week, month, and year brings us closer to the inevitable event of your second coming. We know it will happen someday, and even if some of us pass away, our next conscious thought will be to see you approaching. If we need to repent, help us now to be able to do so. We want to see you as the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, the completion of our faith. Lord, we want to be among those who will witness what Isaiah says in Isaiah 25, 8 and 9. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord hath spoken it, and it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Help us, Father, to be ready through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen and amen. through the snow this morning um we're grateful to see you all and thank you for your wonderful message um and i want to thank those who are watching online who may not have been able to make it through the snow i hope you're all safe and warm and we wish you a blessed happy Sunday.